want to welcome everyone to um, our presentation today, um, Dimension Sciences, How to Revitalize Science in Brazil. Uh, I'm Pamela Villars. I'm your moderator for today's program. I'm very happy to be here with you this morning, and I am also drinking coffee. <laughs> so Dimension Sciences, to remind those of you who are new to us, is a new nonprofit that focuses on the inclusion of minorities in science. And we do this through a couple of ways. We do it through innovative research and through fostering science education, higher education for our scholars. Our scholars receive mentoring, uh, they receive education and well, scholarships, which helps fund that innovative research. Uh, the other thing we do is we're committed to sharing uh, what we can with the public to foster science education for the public. And, and really this presentation, How to Revitalize Science in Brazil, is our third public event. And we thank you so much for joining us. We are recording this event, so if you sign in late or as you sign in, if you want to share the presentation with anyone, it will be available. Uh, your ability to talk here is muted. Uh, we won't be able to see you either, but you should be able to see our panelists. So let me introduce our panelists. Uh, our moderator, sort of our host for the conversation is Mastro Alves Ferreira. He's a Dimension Scientist board member, and he is a geneticist in Brazil. We also have Stevens Rehen, who is a neuroscientist who specializes in stem cell research, and Fabio Golvaya, who's a researcher and a science educator. They all have extensive bios. Um, it would take me at least 10 minutes to read all of them. So please go to our Dimension Science website if you'd like to learn more about them and their work because you will be very impressed. So there will be a 30 minute conversation uh, with our scientists during that time, you may send any questions that you have for them in, using the question and answer chat window. So after 30 minutes, then I will uh, share your questions with them. They will answer as many of them as they can in the time that we have left, uh, and then we will close. I hope you stay on for the closing because we will be sharing where you can get more information about Dimension Sciences. Um, and so um, I think we are off. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Masio, who will be taking it from here. Okay, thank you, Pamela, for the nice introduction. So the idea of this workshop came from an article that you uh, sent to Brazilian Reports uh, that was written by me and Marta Godinho, members of Dimension Science. So, uh, the invitation of the the, the, the tie in the title of the uh, article was an initiative of Bob Chapman, a board member of uh, Dimension Size. Uh, I should say in the first moment when I got the invitation that uh, I didn't have any idea how to propose solutions in a moment of crisis. Without, of course, I, I, I was without any perspective of change in a short time. So the economic crisis started in 2016 the second year of the second term of President Dilma Rousseff. So in 2015, the year before, so we had a record of public investment in science and technology, uh, reaching about 1.35%, uh, still far from 2%, that's considered by specialists ideal, uh, but you are moving the right direction. So uh, the year of 2016 was the landmark of the collapse of science in Brazil. For the last four years, you have the situation just got worse than before. So consider now the situation. So you think so that a major problem is the public sector. So one obvious, obvious question is, uh, is the participation of this, the, the private sector important for revitalization of science? So I'd like to start the, the webinar uh, inviting uh, Stevens that uh, besides uh, his experience as in academia as a professor in Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro. He has experience also in the private sector working in the uh, IDOR. So, DOR Institute of Research and Education. So, 
Stevens, what's your feeling about that? So can the private, uh, private sector help to revitalize science in Brazil? If, uh, thank you, Marcio, Pamela, and uh, Dimension Science for putting us together here. It's a pleasure to be here discussing this very ambitious uh, uh, question, right? So uh, one thing that's important to put in, in mind, especially in now, is that like science needs public support. If you get, for example, the, the case of US, uh, despite all of the investment of the private investor investment in science, there more than half of the investment in the universities comes from, from the public sector, right? It is around 2.8% of the GDP. And uh, recently there, there was some kind of a bipartisan bill between Democrats and Republicans that are trying to put uh, more than $100 billion investment in science for the next uh, five years. It, it, without uh, forgetting about the investment in almost $4 billion to study coronavirus. If you compare with the private sector, it goes to 1.5, uh, 1.7%. 1 so definitely the, import, that there's, uh, the importance of the private sectors go uh, besides the, the funding, because as I said, the funding is especially important coming from the public sector. But the, public, but the private sector can be like faster in, on their decisions. So for example, now like it was very fast to put together the Door Institute with the Oxford uh, and in, in, in the way to try to test the vaccine in, in, in Rio and Salvador. So this is one example of the importance of mixing public and private uh, initiatives to boost science everywhere. But here we have a different challenge that goes beyond the, the, the need of putting together private and public sectors, is that we are living in some kind of anti-science atmosphere that's basically raised by the government. So, of course, we, we, we have the, ch the chance of changing it when you change the president, right? But it's probably going to happen in 2022. So now any kind of effort to put together science uh, from the private and the public sector is important. I'm, I'm, I'm in, on, on summary, I don't think that like the private sector is going to save science anywhere, but we have to put them, them together and the uh, initiatives that they are starting to happen in Brazil are extremely important as some kind of uh, guidance for the future. Uh, cool, uh, Steven. So, but how, how to work the system in Idor? So the funds that you receive are from the private sector or are from the government or from the, the, the NPQ or the CAP? It's how, how it works there? It's, it, we, we, we are able to uh, apply and to receive funding from both, from the public sector and from the private sector. What makes a difference uh, in, at EDOR is that like, it's uh, sometimes faster for you to organize a grant, to apply for grants from the private sector and also from the public ones. So this kind of a speed of things happening there, it's, uh, it's a difference that, that is important for everybody that are associated with uh, EDOR. So mm -hmm. we need to, to learn a little bit from the private sector to uh, maybe get a little bit less bureaucratic with less red tape. To, to work with, with, with science. I think that, 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 that's important. But again, there is no country that can survive without the public investment. So I, I also agree with that. So in at least in my field also, I tried several times to get uh, uh, funds from the private sector. It's quite difficult. It's, it's a quite uh, hard work. And what about you, Fabio? Do you have any uh, experience with the funding with the private sector? Can you tell me uh, more about some, any data about the private sector, uh, like um, functioning functioning in the, the science in Brazil, or how they are important if they if they are if there are any any data about that. Well, uh, I don't don't have any data at hand because that's not exactly my, my field of expertise. But I, I can I can tell you, and I agree with Stevens in, in the sense that there is no way of thinking about science, especially in Brazil without the public sector. This is very, very important because you have to understand that our system of science is absolutely based on uh, public universities. Most of our scientific production is done by public universities and not privates for, from the private sector. So this uh, may be the, the partnership that, may make, that, 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 that can make easier for the funds from the private sector come to the university as the public and private uh, uh, sector uh, corporations that the government try to to um, promote 
It's very important. And one thing that's critical is the speed of it. Re really, Stevens are uh, absolutely uh, right on this because without speed uh, and the ability to de-bureaucratize all the process of receiving the money and spending the money and importing stuff from abroad. You know, we have a serious problem about e uh, 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 of, of the importation of every kind of chemicals and genetic material and so the, the bureaucracy in Brazil is something, uh, you know, unbelievable. And it was something that I think me and Stevens talk about this for about 30 years since we, in, we started in, in our university. Uh, we are talking about this, the problem of how, how it is difficult to import stuff to Brazil and how taxation is very, very high, even to science. And this makes no sense because we are just paying these taxes from a government part to the government back again. You know, right. so, what's, yeah. what's the logic of this? And, and mainly the paperwork that's necessary to, uh, to get the, 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 the material in Brazil, is, it's unbelievable. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's one important point. Most of the science is, is made by the public sector. So 95% of the science is made by, by the public sector. So, uh, the private sector has uh, like a small uh, percentage you know, on that, so uh, that's another uh, important information. So, well, so that's our first impression. So the private sector is not a solution at that, in that moment, uh, at least uh, what I heard from you guys. Is there another? I mean, is there a, a, a possibility to change that that uh, that field? So to change for for to, to improve the, the participation of the private sector. That you have any ideas online on that, about that, no? or that's something that is can be done uh, as fast as you you'd like. What's your impression about that? Is, is that is there any possibility to to change that that picture? I think that that's some sense we are okay. I think that that's some sense we are living this kind of uh, situation now. We have more uh, input from the private sector in the, some of the basic science fields. Uh, we don't have so many things going on in terms of the industry, like we don't have a lot of investment in R and D. Uh, and but there is some ways that we can try to do to improve that. For example, if you go to uh, one uh, comparison that we can do is with Chile, right? Chile has a very interesting uh, uh, strategy. They are doing a lot of partnerships with companies in California, and they and they are these companies in California. They are putting uh, funding. They are investing to do R and D in Chile. So they have like mm -hmm. a big companies in California doing their uh, science in Chile because they have a, a very good science. They have uh, very good scientists, and in terms of the of the the the, the, the amount of the investment, it's cheaper to do science there. So this is some, it's, it's a kind of example in which we can do these things in partnership with some, with some companies. We have a, a five year already a, a, a agreement with L'Oreal, with the company L'Oreal, in which we developed for them some of uh, different cell types and uh, to, do, to, to be used in research in, in cosmetics, both in Europe and in Brazil. So this kind of things is, is, is happening. And of course, you have to be more open inside the public uh, universities for this kind of partnership. This is one challenge. We have to challenge, we have to change the way that we see the private sector, sector and the, the importance of putting both together. This is, uh, uh, we, we see this happening in a very good sense in Europe, in Asia, and uh, in the US. We, 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 this is one way to do the same here. And I really like the example of, of Chile at some sense. Mm -hmm. But again, mm -hmm. we will need the, not only the funding, but also the, the support from the public, from the government, from the public sector to do this kind of thing happen, to have this kind of thing happen. Yeah, that's a, a good, it's an interesting information. So how, I mean, people in Brazil can get, I mean, scientists in Brazil can get funds from other companies abroad. So that's, that's some, some important information. So Fabio, you are going to tell something? Yeah, uh, you know, we have uh, in, in Brazil a, a kind of funding from the government that's basically called the, the sectari sectorial funds, you know, that's based on any kind of taxation that's put it on a certain kind of sector of the industry, and this money can go to science. And, and it's quite an interesting model. 
The problem in Brazil is that uh, science policy is normally done uh, in terms of, uh, of, 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 a pro of an idea of all or nothing about something. So during some time, this money could only go for the specific uh, sector that the fund was created. And this generated a kind of problem because there's too much money for a so little area. And this area is normally uh, any kind of uh, science area, they need the support from other areas. So it was something like mm -hmm. you put a lot of money with just one place and the other places that make this this mountain go high will not go because there's no money. Mm -hmm. Further, when we are in the, the during the, the eight years of government uh, from uh, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, he changed this rule. He said, well, this money from the sectorial funds should not be only for the sectorial funds. But he changed it from the opposite way, he said, well, there's no, uh, no connection of this. This made a very uh, impact, a great impact in terms of, of science in Brazil because there's suddenly a lot of money for areas that never had. But on the other sense, you have a problem on the sectorial funds because the area specific that was uh, needed for that was now with little money. So uh -huh. mm -hmm. we have a lot of problem in Brazil in terms of policy, science policy, in terms of not looking at things. It's not a question of this, or that is the middle ground. It's something in the middle. It's not like Einstein would say, I think it was Einstein that said, I'm not a physicist, but anyhow, it's not a question of being a, a particle or being a wave. It's, it's in the middle ground of this. It's the two things at the same time. We have to put part of this money for everyone, but part of this money in specific area so that the mountain will go high. So every, every, everything will grow. But uh, you know, it's difficult uh, to see this happening in Brazil. Like we, we have this all of one way or the other way uh, always in, in, in science policy. Good. Good. So, Fabio, uh, another putative drive for the revitalization uh, of science in Brazil could be the science communication. So you have worked for a long time science communication in Museu da Vida, Fundação Oswaldo Cruz. Uh, besides, you have a channel in YouTube, Mineiros de Dados. Uh, dedica dedicates to automatics. Can you tell more? Uh, tell, tell us more about this initiative. Explain how science communication can help to revitalize science in Brazil. First of all, we have to uh, regain a trust in science in Brazil. We are re re living very dark, a very dark moment, a very, a very, a very sad moment for Brazil, because. Um, mainly because of, it, of, of the influence of the move, uh, anti-vax movements, anti-science movements from abroad, because, you know, Brazil is a country in terms of the vaccination that has uh, 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 the other uh, 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 very, very, the people are very uh, prone to be vaccinated. If you say that's a new vaccine, people will vaccine, people will make a queue to receive it. They will think that there will be no problem with this. Uh, even though we know some vaccines have a little kind of a, a, a little bit of a risk, but normally it's less than having the disease. Otherwise, it would not be applied the vaccine. The vaccination, vaccination is always a question of uh, uh, benefit and on the other side, a uh, risk. But now we have a trouble with this. People are starting to have a kind of an anti-vax movement in Brazil, an anti-science movement in Brazil, and this is very, a very, very difficult moment. In this sense, uh, the activities of some uh, Brazilian scientists, uh, that scientists that are going to YouTube and starting to talk about this, like you can talk about Attila Yamarino, uh, uh, Natalia Pasternak, also. Um, Stevens have done a lot of science communication too, uh, in order to, to make people uh, have more contact with science and understand how it works. Because the great problem is that for, for a denier, people that deny of science, they just think, well, one day people say that coffee is good, the other day they say that coffee is, brown, is, is bad. One day they say that I, should, I shouldn't eat eggs, and the other day they say I should eat eggs. Uh, and the question again is, well, it's a middle ground of this. You, shouldn't, you never should do something too much at first. And second, you have to uh, particularize something. Like uh, Stevens once, once introduced me for about uh, 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 research that told 
that until certain amount of coffee, for example, there will be no problem. The problem is that if you cross that line of certain amount of coffee, then will be for some people with some genetic markers, a risk, and for others will be make no, no, will be no trouble. And, and uh, the other thing is make people understand how science works. That means we have no compromise in terms, we are not ba bounded to any kind of uh, error. If we found something is wrong, probably scientists will say this is wrong. Let's put it away, let's start, let, let's start it again. Obviously <laughs> science is done from people, people do mistakes, and people sometimes may defend things passionately. Let's not just think that science is something like a pure, um, you know, saint or something like that. It's constructed by society, it's a, so a so social thing. But in other words, the great thing is that going back to the beginning is something for science that we don't think as something wrong and that we don't think that's something we cannot do. We should do this every time. But do you think that uh, the COVID-19 crisis helped out to reinforce the, the, to the society the importance of science? So that's one important thing. At least my feeling that a lot of people that I know, scientists, start to do something in media. So, and you guys, Fabio and Steven, you start much earlier than that. So you start maybe like 15 or 20 years ago to, to already have a, 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 a hole in the, the scientific communication. What you are feeling with the COVID-19? So you have that people are, are, are more, I mean, scientists is getting more uh, uh, in that field, scientific communication, or you, you didn't think any change, you didn't notice any change in the in the in this in this last three months, I would say. Stevens. Okay, I, I think that that's a very interesting question because there's some kind of opportunity for the science right outreach now. Like we are we are dealing with a virus that's basically going to change our lives, maybe for a very long, long time. And uh, people and the, the society they they we need like more uh, information, more clues about like uh, biology, about uh, medicine, about virology, about epidemiology. And it has become clear because like, we don't have any other kind of leadership. Like we don't have a federal leadership that's going to provide any kind of guidance. So we are living some kind of like a, a free will mixed with natural selection, right? With mm -hmm. the, some sense the survival of the fittest, right? So the fittest, maybe the one with more scientific information regarding social distance, regarding masks, regarding vaccines. So uh, I really think that like we have more people uh, interested in learning about science because this could define the survival. And on the other hand, we have many more scientists that are going to TV, that are writing uh, to the news, the, the, the newspapers. It's, 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 I met, I, yesterday I was watching uh, the cable TV and I saw a, like the, the, this science as uh, Attila, as uh, Fabio mentioned, Natalia is all the time on TV. This is great. It's just like we are in the middle of a strategy, but in the, with a lack of, uh, of uh, guidance, with the, any kind of leadership, but it's thinking about the, the, the opportunity for the science outreach. This is a very important moment because society needs any kind of clue about where the best way to survive. So it, it, it's, it's a good moment for the science outreach, despite the tragedy that we are living. Yeah, and, and, and I, had, I had a feeling before that the, most of the scientists uh, had like a, a deprecating look to the, uh, to the scientists that involve in scientific communication. Is that true, Steven, Fabio? What's your feeling about that? Uh, well, this is, I think this is absolutely true. People for sometimes here in Brazil, at least I can tell this for about 20 years ago, 20 years ago. and this is, well, it's, it's changing during time, but pe people think, well, there's the, this kind of scientists that want to be in the media, they want to communicate, they talk a lot, but he doesn't do really good science because if he was doing good science, he would be just talking to his peers. He will be a very good communicator to his peers in the Congress and not talking to the t television. Uh, I have a very personal experience because I, 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 was, I was someone that do my master degree on the lab and suddenly I just started to work in a science museum. And once I get, get back to my advisor and said, oh, how is things going? And I said, well, I'm working at the science museum and I'm very happy with this. And she just told me, well, you're such a good scientist. When are you going to have, uh, when are you going to leave this kind of museum stuff? This, mm -hmm. this doesn't make sense to us. And I said, well, maybe never, <laughs> because I really <laughs> enjoy it. 
Ellen Finken can be a very good scientist working at the museum. museum. And you know, this, this is really a kind of a, a situation that we see in, 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 in every day because there's this kind of uh, you know, prejudice about uh, people that do science communication. But I think the pandemics are changing really that much uh, uh, because uh, scientists are taking very seriously the importance of having information to people. People are engaging on this. And you know, every day we saw Portugal, at least I saw people from Portugal clapping hands for the people from, uh, the, from healthcare and, and, and then doctors and nurses and so, but we should make a stand up ovation for, for people in science. I know a lot of, of, of doctorate degree students that are working even without uh, a support, without any kind of grant from, from the government and working for free in this time in Brazil just to help trying to ensure that they will have an exam, the, a, a, a kind of a test being done or something that maybe contribute to, to the COVID-19 pandemics in Brazil. And this is quite amazing. And this shows what kind of love that we have when we really deal uh, with science production because, uh, you know, I make there's some serotonin in knowledge gaining, you know, there's something that happens with this and make us, uh, maybe you have a kind of, any kind of study that you have read about this, uh, Stevens, that people that start working with science have some kind of, uh, of neurotransmitters going to him. <laughs> yeah, probably Stevens, you had, had the same feeling yeah, before because you have, you, you are quite often in the media. So what's your feeling about the other scientists when you look at you at the media? So I, I have the feeling also, I mean, for friends that are scientists as well, that they look in a different way for people that go to the media. So that's quite bad in the sense that exactly these people should be valorized for the way that they do uh, and the, 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 to make science more popular. So I think that it's changed the last three months, I, I guess. What's your feeling? How, how are your experience about that? Yeah, I, I would say that I would just add, I think that like uh, Fabio really made a very good overview about the situation, but I'd like to add that I don't think that's something specific uh, from Brazil, like if you get, for example, the, the case of Carl Sagan, right? It was one of the most important scientists in the science outreach uh, field forever, you know? But like, I don't know if you guys know that he was never elected to the uh, US National Academy of Science. And because he was very famous to the society. And uh, despite the fact that he was a very good scientist as well. So we have some kind of, uh, of, of uh, internal uh, lack of support to the science outreach. Uh, when I'm talking now, I'm remembering about my, my uh, conversations with, for example, Roberto Lentz and other guys that they started this kind of science outreach in Brazil several years ago. And they, he told me the same thing, like it was very hard to convince people the importance of the science outreach. And more than that, it was some kind of a second hand, uh, uh, with like second level of importance. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. things are changing. Even before the, the, the COVID-19, we had like a, a change as uh, Fabio said, uh, regarding YouTube, podcasts and other, uh, and, and all of the things that like uh, museums, such as the Museu da Vida were doing to, to, pop, to, to really uh, reach more people. It's a long uh, journey, I would say, to have the science outreach be more incorporated. But for everything that like we're seeing on TV, on the news, things are, 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 are changed. But it was not, not that was something dependent on, on, the, on the, a specific country. It was something that was really internalized in the scientific community. So you think that that happens in any other country? So like we are saying in other countries. So that's, that's all important information as well. I, I thought in the beginning that was something specific to Brazil. So, I, and we are going to the, going to the end of the, 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 the our talk that's pitched because we have a lot to do, a lot to talk. Uh, so, but there is one question that's quite important. So what's the role of nonprofit institutions in the, uh, in the, uh, go to, the, to revitalize science in Brazil. So for instance, you have uh, Instituto Pesquisa Rapilera and more recently Dimension Science that provides fellowship and grants uh, to the scientific community. Do they can play a role in revitalization of science in Brazil? What's your feeling about that, guys? 
I, I would say that like thinking about the happy layer and dimensions, I think that the most important thing is that they bring uh, some kind of uh, fresh air, you know, they bring fresh air and new ideas to the system and it's essential, right? And they also can sponsor more like high risk research. And uh, one thing that I really realized that was very important thinking about the happy layer is that they are putting together scientists from different backgrounds. If you get the traditional uh, grants that they are open to the scientific community, you're always going to uh, biologists go with biologists, uh, like mathematicians go with mathematicians. With this kind of uh, private uh, nonprofit organizations, we can basically play with any kind of combinations and it's very important. So in summary, I think that like, we need fresh air and this and dimensions, Serra Pileira and others can really uh, change the way that we see the importance uh, of, of science. And uh, it also is, is extremely important when you also need to change the view of science, especially when we have an anti-science anti kind of a government. So to revitalize the science, we need more of this uh, private nonprofit uh, uh, input to bring us new ideas. And this yeah. is happening. Yeah, no, that, that's quite quite interesting point, for, uh, uh, Stevens, because exactly this fresh air that makes us think about how to to deal with science. For instance, they have like specific programs to to to, to finance uh, science outreach. That's something that nobody was doing in Brazil before. So, uh, no no institution like CNPq or CAPS was doing. So, yeah, that's that's good point. And Fabio, uh, do you have anything about that? Yeah, you know, one thing that I, I think it's very interesting about uh, the private sectors and the nonprofit organizations in terms of science uh, investment in Brazil specifically is that uh, scientists in Brazil are more used to the way of creating projects and having all the, the you know, all the process of approval and then showing the results in one way uh, that's not so professionalize it, you know, because the, the, the way in the, in the public sector is, um, I, I'm, I, I, it's difficult to explain, but it, people are not so used to doing a kind of a project that can really uh, outreach in other sense, because when people put this in the, in the public sector, normally they will be just analyzed by their peers. And when you put this, on even a private sector, or you can put in, in a, a, a nonprofit organization, people have at, at least to start to think about how they can communicate what they want to do to other kind of, of, of eva evaluators, you know? And normally, uh, when you talk about private sector and you talk about nonprofit organizations, science communication is being something that they, people, people think a lot. Because when the government put money, people say, well, I'll do my research and what's the result this in terms of, of information to the society of what we've done? Because there's normally some direct result that could benefit society in some sense, but what's your science outreach on this? Uh, in the last 10 years, there was some kind of a, of a, of a need in, in this kind of public funding projects to think about this, but especially when you talk about uh, private and nonprofit organization, people ask, well, how can you, how will you, you will communicate your results to society? And in that sense, this obligation to think about science communication made a change because I received a lot of calls from friends that well, I'm applying to this place and uh, well, they say that we need to do some science communication. Don't you want to join us? Because we don't even know how to start with this said, okay, well, I'll take a look on this. And not always I was part of that project, uh, just in small cases, but in one of one another cases that was really more close to me in, in terms of thematics or so, but sometimes said, well, you can think about this and that and that, and you can, you just think, and, and you must communicate this to society in some way. So I think the private and even the, the, the um, uh, mm -hmm. nonprofit organization probably mm -hmm. will think about how this will reach society in a manner different from what our public a, uh, public agents agencies think in Brazil? Well, and uh, how about the, the the grants that they they they, they have? So that's it's just a small fraction, I guess. Yeah, again, the public investment is the most important. That's my feeling, because uh, uh, they they open uh, almost every year uh, a, a call 
but still not, not comparable with the, the what you have from the public sector. You depend very much of that, isn't it? Yeah, so the, the Stevens. Uh, maybe I missed a little the, the, the point here because you mentioned about the importance of the, of the public sector to also to the science outreach. This is no, no. I'm talking about. I mean, consider the the the, the non-profit institutions. They they are financing science, like giving fellowships or grants, uh, but still like a small fraction of of money for that. So compare with what you have from from the public and. Uh, sector so uh, that's that's my point so it's still i mean you depend very much of the public sector comparable compare compare with the the, the, the non-profit institutions or private sector oh yeah it, it happens everywhere right we are talking about this here right there's i think that like the most important thing from the from these uh, uh organizations from these non-profit private organizations is to bring fresh air to bring in more risk and to put people from different fields together Thinking about specifically about the amount of money, there is no no comparison. We can't have any place in the world that will be uh, doing good science with only private money. We need the public money for the, almost everything, and then you can add this uh, private money to 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 help. Of course, if you think about the US, so I would say 55 uh, percent of the money comes from the public sector, and the rest that's the minority. From the private one in Brazil, this 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 uh, difference is of course much much bigger. But still, it's always public funding that will make the difference. The private uh, uh, organizations will bring new ideas. We can change the environment, and this can really spread all over the system. This is, I would say, the the most important legacy from this uh, from these institutions, from these organizations everywhere. Well, and then, then the science communication or the science outreach could help us to make a clear the importance of science for the public, the general public. And then these people, or say the people can in some way uh, uh, ask for the, the, the public sector, so the people that they elect to be more, uh, to take care more of science. That's the, the major point of, of the, I, I would say, the importance of the science communication and the science outreach. So to pressure the good sector to give money, or at least to have a part of their money to, 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 the, to finance science and technology. Isn't it? Is that, that the point? To, to that, that's the most important point of, of science communication, science, science outreach. What do you think about that, Fabio? Uh, well, I think I think the, the importance of, of, of doing this. Uh, I, I, sorry, I, I think I missed the point too. <laughs> sorry about that. So I, I think that you, you should. I mean, the science communication, the science outreach, should make the difference concerning the the people. So the, 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 that the, the science is important. So science yeah. important because of. Uh, 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 of several things that they can bring to the population. So that's the way that a scientist should uh, communicate and make them make that point clear. And then after that, so after change the way that they view the science, they start to pressure the, the, the government to, to, I mean, to, to, to deliver uh, grants and funds for science. So that may be, that's maybe the best way that science communication, science outreach can help us. Uh, well, you know, uh, Wagensberg, a, a physicist uh, from Catalonia, he was responsible for the creation of a museum that's an amazing museum called Museo La Caixa. Uh, it was founded by uh, Fundación La Caixa, that means uh, it's, a, it's a private foundation, but it's uh, as a kind of a bank or something like this. And he told that in nowadays, you cannot think about people not understanding what science is because all of our life is dependent on what science is. So he said, in order to be a citizen nowadays, people need to understand at least a little bit of how science works. And so, so in that sense, I don't think it's not, uh, it's not a, a, exactly a, a, a kind of a trade-off that people, well, you put here money, here are what I'm bringing to you back in terms of science. I think that's one way of communication, okay, and it's something that's important, especially on the pandemics. Yeah, we think that 
in this moment is, is sensible to think that people are all running uh, together to work with, with a willingness to cooperate with all uh, an ability to put all their efforts and expertise to this because this is a very important thing at the moment. There was some criticism now for the funding for the, the uh, particle accelerator in Sweden, uh, in, in Switzerland. Because I said, well, why doing this now? It's a lot of money and we are in another moment, maybe in two years from now, but that's not the moment to call about splitting particles this way. But you know, mm -hmm. maybe splitting particles will make a difference to the next stuff. We don't know. Right. And, and so you don't have to make, be in the difference of applied science and basic science. And that's in that way, that's one thing that I think that's important to make people understand that's what, not a trade-off that you put this money in science and then so solve this particular and objective problem, uh, you have to think science as a more complex stuff. And we can use an example, a very interesting example that people normally do in museums, that's how is the work of science outreach for NASA? NASA do a lot of science, uh, of work of science outreach for people to learn about science in terms of uh, astronomy, something that is, uh, quite ethereal if you think about because we're looking for planets or so and how this will solve COVID-19 pandemics, how this will make us have more uh, food in the table, an everyday table. <clears throat> but this makes people think about something that's lovable as well as science, to look at skies, to dream. And, May I uh, add and, and people, when think about cutting money from NASA, people say, no, don't cut the ma NASA money, because this is important. Stevens. Okay. So I just like a last comment from, from, so, sorry, Stevens, go ahead. So I have last, the last moment, because you still have time, we have time to, 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 to question. So go ahead, do your comment, and then you move for the questions, because I, I see now that there is a lot of questions here for us. It, it, it's, a very, it's a very short comment. That's one thing that I'm go just going to, to, to add, uh, because of the example of the NASA that Fabio said. We can't also uh, put a lot of expectation on the, the effort of individual scientists. We need to put effort and to expect that institutions that are going to make this kind of organization of the science outreach. In the university, in the, in the institutions, we, we should have people with different uh, backgrounds and different uh, kind of uh, perspectives of the work. We can't expect from the scientists, that for, for all of the scientists that are also going to do science outreach but we should expect from all of the organizations, from all of the institutions, that they are going to have a strong department of science outreach. This is important because if we, if we don't do that, we're going to be expecting for everybody at the university, okay, you have to teach, you have to do research, and you have to do science, science outreach. And this doesn't really work well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, uh, so let's, let's go for the question. So I'd like to invite Pamela again. So, Pamela, do you have uh, already some questions? I'm looking now in the chat, so uh, uh, I have many, many questions. It's very hard to choose. <laughs> um, so I'll go back to the beginning a little bit. There was a lot of interest in the conversation between the, about the private sector and, and the industry and the public sector, right? So those two things. So how can we improve the connection? And I think probably also funding between academia and, and the industry, the private sector. So maybe, maybe, maybe Stevens and Fabio can, can answer that better than me. Stevens, you first. You're the private okay. sector guy. <laughs> <laughs> not exactly. Not exactly. Yeah. No, not exactly. But, but you have, more, we have, deal, you have deal with, with the private sector in more than me. So. Yeah, I remember a few years ago that we have some kind of uh, efforts to like, for example, uh, offering some fellowships for people from the university to go to the industry. That kind of movement didn't really uh, flourish as we would expect. I really like the, this uh, system that like I saw in, uh, in Santiago in Chile, where they like they have a, a big campus that they call the, the uh, Ciencia da Vida or something like that, the campus from the Ciencia da Vida, in which they have uh, space for uh, these uh, companies from everywhere to uh, contract people from the universities to do science there and to do R&D that are going then to be uh, connected with the, their uh, offices in the, in, the, in the US, for example. I think that this could be something interesting. We have this kind of uh, 
things happening here. We have, as I mentioned to you, with uh, L'Oreal, with other companies, but we have many more people in the university that can do some kind of uh, this kind of combination. But to do that, we need the university also to be more, more open. And it's not only the university, because I see, especially at the uh, UFRJ, UFRJ people really uh, willing to do this kind of combination. But we need also in, among the, the professors, among the associate professors, this kind of a will. Okay, let's talk to them. Let's see how can we, we work together. But again, I'm just going to emphasize it, it once more. I think that this combination is good, but without the public funding, there is no science here or anywhere. Um, well, just sorry, uh, it, was, it was more of a, of a slightly joke on this, but I, I, I do understand that, that people, people need, uh, we, we need here in Brazil more investment from the private sector, really. We know that there's a difference in terms of the private sector investment in Brazil, if you make a comparison from other countries. Uh, there's a question from Leonardo Schutz da Silva that asked about the prof professionalization of the, the activity as a researcher in Brazil. And this would be something interesting in, in some manner because you know most of our, of our work in force is based on people that are doing their master and doctorate degrees and receiving very, very, very little money from what their expertise is. This is absolutely different from whatever you can think. I just talked before with Marcio and Stevens that uh, we have a, a, a kind of a we have a kind of situation nowadays that people that work as a scientist in a master or a doctorate degree about uh, maybe 25 years ago would re receive 3.5 more in terms of, of, uh, of earning. And even though it was a kind of support that doesn't mean any kind of, doesn't count as time work it, you know, and people to have their retirement, they would not count this. So a scientist in Brazil start to work effectively um, to count for the government with 30 years old, maybe 35 years old, you know, maybe because they have to, they start a lot, they do a postdoctorate, a doctorate, a master degree, do all of this thing, and nothing counts to the government as work because they just pay directly a amount of money, very little money. I have to stress this. I think it's outrageous what's going on in this, in this sense because of people with very, very high expertise and they are creating stuff and they are discovering things that will result in a lot of money for the country because in other, in other things, uh, solving problems, uh, things that will be used by the industry. And so, you know, it's, it's very, 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 uh, uh, Something, something that we cannot understand. You have examples like Netherlands. Netherlands, you are, you are, you have a contract when you start doing a kind of postdoctorate. You are, you are treated as someone that's you're a worker. You have a, 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 a kind of an insurance, a health insurance. You don't have, you have nothing for for people that are doing a master and yeah. a doctorate degree in Brazil. And this is this is is, is absolutely outrageous for me. So that's that's um, remind me a point about the young researchers, so young scientists that just doing the, the master degree and the, the doctorate now. What what you could say to these guys concerning like uh, 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 science outreach? How can you in some way drive them to to, to change? Because you are already uh, in this area for a long a long time, more than thirty years. So uh, I think that you you have some hope to to change their minds in the beginning. Uh, so to, to, to start them to, to worry about that since the beginning, how, how your experience? So Fabio works with, 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 with uh, uh, science outreach and also uh, uh, Stevens. So do you, do you in some way, do, do you uh, stimulate them to participate? How do, 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 do you do that? So how is the, the, the way to do that? Okay, I think that like uh, science outreach is extremely important. But I also try to advise them and, and to talk to them about the importance of first to become a good scientist. I think that like the best scientists uh, that are doing science outreach, they need to know how science works. What is, uh, what's the, the scientific methodology? What it means like to do an experiment? What means to raise a hypothesis? I see some of these uh, young students, I'm not saying this, some of them here, I'm saying uh, where I, I used, used to go, 
that like they want to become uh, like a, a scientist that are doing outreach. But even before they go to a lab, they know how science works. So I, I think that anybody that is doing science can become a very good science outreach if they really first know how to do science. And the same happens also for the journalists. I see lots of journalists that they can then go do some kind of a course to know how science works. Because if not, you're, you're going to be like some kind of a commentators of everything, a generic commentator. It's important mm -hmm. for you to go deep into that. So I really uh, encourage people that they want to go more into the science outreach to do science communication. But I think that's important be before doing that to know how science works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Fabio, do you want to add something? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I pretty much agree with, with, with Stevens. Uh, you have to be a good science, scientist to do science, a, a good science uh, communication. This is very important. Uh, normally, there's some issues that we found out that people say that, well, the problem is that we do very good science and then the journalists do a very bad job. And that's not true. Uh, I think that's, you know, there's some problems sometimes in some news in the newspapers, but sometimes this was just induced by the, the, the scientists too, in some sense that, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a track between the lab and the news that something may went wrong and that's not to blame one or, or blame the other. And as I normally say to my, to my students, I normally say that the, the question is not who's wrong, but where were we wrong? You know, because if you're just pointing fingers that said, he's the wrong guy or he's the wrong guy, you don't solve the problem. You have to know where things get, went wrong in order to solve the problem, because it doesn't matter who was wrong. It matter where. And in that, in that sense, uh, I think that uh, uh, um, if, if we do, like Stephen said, that in, in the institutions, from the beginning, from the formation, from the, in the universities, when people start doing and learning how to be a good uh, uh, you know, biologist, a good medical doctor, a good uh, nurse, a good everything said, well, communication is something important. And in medicine, people have this kind of, of, of already, uh, this kind of uh, preoccupation because they deal directly with the patients as the nurses. And so we biologists, sometimes as we are in the lab with our, well, we deal with rats normally, so rats doesn't need such a science communication uh, <laughs> tools, but you know, we deal with this, we don't deal with people, but we do when we, when we do, when we, when we give lessons, we give speeches and we do so. Right. In that sense, I think that's important, really important that people have a more of a formation on this to be able to communicate better. May I add something very quickly? Yeah, go ahead. One thing that's also important is that even for the scientists that they just want to become, to be scientists, when you do science communication, your papers reach more people. There's a new study showing that like if you Twitter, your work, you're going, going to be uh, more cited. So it's important. Science communication is not only going to TV, it's not only going to the newspaper, it's even communicating among the other peers. It's extremely important for the success of your science. Good, good. Ben, you want to, to uh, is there any other question to, to them? Because you're almost there. Yeah? Yeah, so unfortunately we need to stop, but because it was such a good conversation, I think many of the questions you covered before I even got to ask them. So thank you so much for that. And before I put the last slide up, I just want all of you to hear that there is an article on the front page of the Estado de Sao Paulo today about dimension scientists. So we're very proud and so Perhaps that's some of the science communication and education uh, that, um, that we're talking about. So very briefly, if you had a Twitter version, so here's your Twitter version on, um, on Zoom, your best advice or words of inspiration for a young scientist, Twitter version. Uh, we'll start with Stevens. I would say that like for you to do a good science, a good science, you really need to be happy in this process. So I think that I would look for uh, happiness to do to a better job. Great career advice in any field. <laughs> Thank you. 
Fabio Twitter version, words of inspiration. Oh God, this, I'm, I'm, I'm not good with, with 140 words. <laughs> <laughs> really, really. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a more a Facebook user. <laughs> I do what we call in Brazil all the time, the textão, the big text, you know, <laughs> really, really. Uh, really, if, I, really? If, I would say something, if I would say something to people that are, are, are working with science, it's, well, be true to yourself. Uh, keep doing what you are, what you are, what you, what you are, you have faith on it, because this is important from every career, as you told. But especially think about that what you try to do is something that would make more sense if you try to communicate more. I think science communication is key in every sense. Maybe you're not the person that will be that will, will give this, uh, uh, will do a YouTube channel or maybe you're not the guy that will be give interviews to the TV, but maybe you will be the guy with a Twitter account that can tweet about good papers that you read or something like this. And this is, this is quite important too. We, if we follow people on Twitter in order to see uh, that, that give good advice of people, of, 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 of articles they read, and this is interesting. It's a way of doing stuff. And especially, if you see that someone doesn't have a, a, a right of a belief in science, doesn't understand things, you may have to get, uh, have some patience and try to, to, to help people on this and to understand better how science works. Because this idea that, well, one day they say one thing, the other, say the, the other day they say the other. Uh, this is the key thing that people have to understand. That okay. science, don't have a, a, science will not be bound to errors. We just revise ourselves every day. And this is what people say that uh, normally it's, it's meant to be something wrong in life, uh, uh, that people go back in one position. And this is truly how science works. We go back because we want to go further. Okay, thank you. I'll it's more like a test on Facebook, but okay. <laughs> right, right. So we'll add to your advice, use Twitter and use the right hashtag. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Marcio, your Twitter version, best advice. Yes, I would say that re re resilience, resilience and faith. That may be the two words that I would mm -hmm. say for those that work in, in science. So. Oh, all right. That, so all of you, thank you so much. Um, we so appreciate your time today. Um, and um, as we close, uh, I want to let remind everyone that they can find information about your bios um, at the um, on the on our website. So that's very important. Um, and sorry, let me get to this last slide. You can find our website here. We really appreciate you being here. I asked you to stay on so you could make sure you knew about all of our channels. Um, our next public event will be July twenty seventh. Um, and you can find out information about what we'll be doing next on our website. You can follow us on Instagram, on Twitter, as we've talked about, on Facebook, um, all of those social media accounts. And uh, your questions were fantastic. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. But if you liked our scientists today and you want to share this information with anyone else, the recording of this webinar will be posted on all of our channels uh, within the next week, two weeks, uh, very shortly. And last, we didn't get to a question about donations, but it's clear that funding was an issue for all of you that were here. And certainly we would greatly appreciate it if you could donate to Dimension Sciences. All of the money goes towards funding our scholarships uh, and running our program. We have seven scholars right now, uh, and we want to have more as we finish up with this group. So thank you so much for being with us today. All of our scientists, thank you for your words of wisdom. Uh, thank you for your passion, your inspiration. Thank you audience for being here. And uh, good morning, bom dia, bom dia, buenos dias. Have a good day. <laughs>